Forty years ago, a world-famous biologist, Paul Ehrlich, and a world-famous physicist, now science advisor to the President of the United States, John Holdren, invented a special equation in honor of the first Earth Day. Their equation was simple. I equal P-A-T. I stood for environmental impact. P stood for population. A stood for affluence, and T stood for technology. In other words, as people get more numerous, get wealthier, and use more technology, the Earth suffers. The moral of the equation, so far as the Earth goes, is it would be better to have fewer people, less wealth, and less technology. Well, 11 years later, in 1980, a scholarly study commissioned by President Jimmy Carter, the Global 2000 Report to the President, echoed this moral by claiming that, quote, if present trends continue, the world in 2000 will be more crowded, more polluted, less stable ecologically, and more vulnerable to disruption than the world we live in now. Serious stresses involving population, resources, and environment are clearly visible ahead. Despite greater material output, the world's people will be poorer in many ways than they are today." Unquote. And in a related vein, in 2007, an international panel of scientists, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, warned that increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would bring on global climate change. This, they claimed, would lead to worldwide catastrophes in the 21st century, as sea levels rose, rain patterns changed, and climate brought on diseases became pandemic. You have probably also heard the much-repeated claim that the United States, with only 6% of the world's people, uses over 30% of the world's resources and causes over 30% of the world's pollution. In other words, the moral again seems to be that we have to live more simply, use fewer resources, reduce our population and cut back on our wastes if we want to be good world citizens and protect the earth for future generations. Well, these claims and predictions have been blessed with such wide media publicity that many people today do not know that there is substantial disagreement about all of them within the scientific world. In fact, according to many experts, most of these claims and predictions are exaggerated, many are seriously misleading, and others are simply false. As the comic song from the Gershwin opera Porgy and Bess goes, it ain't necessarily so. This program will explain why. So let's take the issues one at a time. Resources, population, and climate change. Resources first. Natural resources are necessary for wealth, but not sufficient. Many of the richest countries in the world, like Japan, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Taiwan, have few natural resources. And many of the poorest countries in the world, like Nigeria, Cuba, Peru, and Russia, have rich natural resources. So what then is the connection between natural resources and wealth? Well, many people today many people, does not include most scientists and economists, think that resources and wealth are more or less a fixed quantity. In other words, the world's natural resources and accompanying wealth are like a large pie, 
If I get a bigger piece, you will have to be satisfied with a smaller piece. If a few get rich, the majority will have to be poor. If we in the United States use too many resources, the rest of the world will have to do with fewer. Well, indeed, in past agricultural ages, that is before the scientific and industrial revolutions a few hundred years ago, this view made sense. Wealth then was usually measured in two all-important natural resources, land and gold. Countless wars were fought over both land and gold because the only way one group could get wealthier was to steal land or gold from another group. Well, all of this changed a few hundred years ago when humans learned they could use natural resources to create wealth and then to multiply it using powerful new technologies in a free market capitalist economic system. It was no longer necessary to steal from one another to get more resources like land or gold. You could create wealth on your own. You could create new resources like steam and aluminum and electricity and plastics and new kinds of food and then multiply them and buy and sell them instead of just using or stealing them. The wealth of the world, in other words, was no longer like a big pie where a few fat cats got the big pieces, leaving the crumbs to the poor. Instead, the pie could be multiplied over and over again, so potentially everyone could have a big piece. This new view of resources and wealth did not take root in most people's minds, however, until quite recently. And it still is not widely appreciated in many parts of the world, including our Western world of affluence. For instance, consider the following. 150 years ago, the population of the United States was less than 31 million people. The average life expectancy was 43 years. There was a telegraph system, but no one had a telephone. The average wage was less than 15 cents an hour. Even the very rich had no indoor plumbing, refrigeration, air conditioning, electricity, or anesthesia for an operation. There were railroads, but less than 10 miles of paved roads in all the United States. There were no cell phones, television sets, radios, computers, airplanes, or automobiles. As for education, fewer than 1% of the people graduated from high school, and 99% of all doctors had no college education. Most people, except perhaps the 800,000 men who died in the Civil War, rarely traveled more than a few miles from where they were born. And forests covered about a third of the United States and Canada. Today, the U.S. population is nearly 10 times as great, over 300 million. Life expectancy in the United States and most of the industrialized world is more than twice as long, over 79 years. There are over 250 million automobiles and 2.6 million miles of paved roads in the U.S. alone. Over 85% of the people in the United States have graduated from high school and over 25% from college. Nearly everyone has a telephone, a TV set, usually more than one, indoor plumbing, refrigeration, air conditioning, electricity, and anesthesia for an operation. Most people have a cell phone and a computer. And most people in the U.S. and Canada ride regularly in automobiles, trains, and airplanes for thousands of miles in their lifetime. And forests today cover about a third of the United States and Canada. All of these same sharp contrasts hold, to a greater or lesser extent, for just about any country in the world, including the two most populous countries, India and China. In other words, people all over the world are hundreds of times wealthier, use hundreds of times more natural resources, and yes, produce hundreds of times more waste than a much smaller population did 150 years ago. 
Well, if resources are so limited, where did all the new resources come from that made this incredible new wealth possible? If resources and wealth are like a big piece of pie, how come everyone has a bigger piece now than their great-great-great-grandparents did 150 years ago? Well, the answer to all these questions, of course, is simple enough. Natural resources and wealth are not a fixed pie. Instead, the more we use, the more we create. The wealthier we are, the wealthier our children can be. And we should be proud, not ashamed, that we in the United States use 30% of the world's resources because in the process we create way more than 30% of the world's wealth. The truth is that the only limit to resources and to wealth is the ultimate natural resource, the creativity of human minds. Here's how it works. As an important resource, say an important energy resource 150 years ago, like whale oil, begins to become scarce and more expensive, this presents a challenge. Some people take up that challenge looking to make a profit. They begin searching for alternatives, and some people fail. But their failures are personal, and society as a whole does not suffer. Some people succeed and make big profits, and their success benefits all. Well, that's exactly what happened when whale oil began to run out in the middle of the 19th century. People found petroleum in the ground that could do the same job as whale oil, better and more cheaply. More important, humans soon found that oil could not only fuel our lamps, it could power newly invented automobiles and trains and airplanes and bulldozers and tractors and ocean liners. And it, along with other fossil fuels like coal and gas, could provide the raw material for newly invented materials like plastics and medicines, and fertilizers, and pesticides, and paints, and cosmetics. It could replace wood to heat homes and offices and schools. It could create electricity and transform agricultural and industrial production. It could help create a world where everyone could get an education. It could be a key link in creating a new world where everyone could be a winner. Now you say, yes, okay, but we will eventually run out of oil, and then we will be in a pickle. Well, first of all, experts have been predicting the world will run out of oil ever since it was first discovered. In 1908, the U.S. Bureau of Mines predicted that a total future world supply of oil would be 22.5 billion barrels. We have used three times that much since 1908 and have at least three times that much in known reserves. In 1939, officials predicted the U.S. oil supplies could last only another 13 years. And in 1979, President Jimmy Carter declared the imminent oil shortage a national crisis of immense dimensions kind of like religious cults that have predicted over and over again the world will end in the near future, that future keeps getting further and further away. Today, in the early 21st century, for instance, new discoveries and new technologies to extract oil from the earth have convinced some experts that the U.S. alone has enough oil under its soil and continental shelf to power the entire world for the next hundred years. But let's say these optimistic experts are wrong, and we do begin to run out of oil. Or more likely, considerations of possible climate change from burning too much oil, or coal or gas, puts a severe restraint on its use. What then? Well, as oil becomes more expensive and scarce, or governmental laws restrict its continued use in order to prevent climate change and or to wean us from buying foreign oil, people will take up the challenge and find profits in developing new sources of energy, like nuclear power, solar power, natural gas, tidal power, geothermal power, fusion power, hydrogen power, windmill power, or by increasing efficiency. Remember, no one predicted computers, cell phones, or satellites 50 years ago. 
And these new sources of energy will replace petroleum, just as petroleum replaced whale oil. And this process of resource creation and wealth creation is already happening today. The same story could be told about other important natural resources. Take wood. True, most of the original forests in the U.S. and Canada have disappeared. When European settlers first arrived on this continent, about half of it was forested. In the 18th and 19th centuries, colonists, farmers, and lumber companies cut down large sections of this natural resource, and we used the wood to heat homes, to cook food, to fence farms, to make paper, and to build houses, barns, mills, and factories. In the 20th century, however, forests in the U.S. and Canada have for the most part come back. So much so that today forests cover about one-third of the continent. And every year they are increasing, not decreasing, in acreage. How does that happen? People plant more trees than they cut down. And nature, too, plants more trees after we cut them down because trees are a renewable resource. And contrary to what many people think, despite the increased demand for wood and paper worldwide in the 21st century, forests in the U.S. and Canada are growing year by year in both quantity and quality. Or take food. Farms produce just enough food for 88 million people in the U.S. in 1908. The same, or actually less, farmland produced more than enough food for 300 million people in the U.S. in 2008, and there was enough left over to help feed many millions of people in India, China, Southeast Asia, and South America. How? Well, people invented better ways to farm better ways to genetically modify corn and wheat and soybeans, better ways to prevent crops from being eaten by insects and moles. They used tractors instead of horses and so forth and so forth. A farm family in 1800 could produce just enough food to feed itself and half a person more. The average farm family in the U.S. today can feed itself and 50 people more. We have used immense amounts of iron, copper, aluminum, tin, lead, silver, and gold, and other metals. Yet today, all of these metals are cheaper, that is, more plentiful, than they were a hundred years ago. How did this happen? People found better ways of extracting metals from their earthbound ores. People found ways of using metals more efficiently. People found better ways of recycling metals. And people found substitutes for many metals. Let's not go too far too fast, however. There's at least one exception to this good news story about resources. That exception is wilderness conservation and species preservation. New forests are not the same as old forests. A species lost can never be regained. Theodore Roosevelt recognized this 100 years ago when he pioneered in creating our first national parks and wildlife reserves. And today, all over the world, governments and individual citizens and nonprofit organizations are carrying forward this important work. Here in one of the poorest provinces of China, for instance, the Nature Conservancy is helping the Chinese government create its first national park. Despite the bad news from the Amazon basin in South America, people are rallying today to slow down and eventually to stop the destruction of the rainforest there and in other places around the world. Here again, the moral is not to denounce wealth or populations or technology, but rather to welcome technology, to encourage wealth creation, and to enhance and improve the free market economic systems that have brought such technology and wealth to the world. This intelligent use of technology and free markets to create wealth, as a matter of fact, is the very thing that will make it possible 
to preserve more wildernesses and to prevent more species extinctions in the future. A Chinese proverb put it this way, a peasant must stand for a long time on a hillside with his mouth open before a roast duck flies in. Natural resources are like that. To those who stand and wait or expect governments to solve all problems, resources are few and far between. And if we use them up too fast, there will be less for those who come after. On the other hand, to those who search and work creatively, resources and wealth are unlimited. We can all be winners. Population, with some interesting twists what we just pointed out about resources is more or less true of populations. The same biologist who helped invent the equation I equal PAT, Paul Ehrlich, his specialty was insects, also wrote a best-selling book in the 1976 called The Population Bomb. In the first sentence of the book, he boldly stated that, quote, in the 1970s and 1980s, Hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. India, he claimed, was a basket case. He recommended what is called triage. When there is no hope, we have to simply abandon the effort, steal ourselves to the inevitable, and let hundreds of millions of people die. Well, he was wrong, of course just as we haven't run out of oil, metals, or wood. So hundreds of millions of people did not die of starvation. In fact, the exact opposite happened. Even though, yes, there are still hungry people in the world, many millions fewer are hungry today than when the population of the world was half or a quarter of what it is today. India can not only feed itself, it is exporting food in the 21st century, and the largest country in the world, China, is much the same story. In the 1970s, Ehrlich's view was the popular one among both scientists and citizenry. He himself was a regular guest on TV talk shows. United Nations commissions in those days echoed the view that overpopulation was a serious problem, perhaps the most serious problem the world faced. The recommendation was that drastic measures were needed to control population in order to reduce environmental damage and work toward a more sustainable state. Today, on the other hand, in the 21st century, after the world population has increased from 4.5 billion to over 6 billion, most scientists who have studied population issues say that at most, overpopulation is a minor issue as world issues go. Some places, as in Europe and Japan today, we need to encourage population growth, not decline. As for developing economies of Asia, Africa, and South America, the rate of population growth has radically slowed down. And as these countries do become industrialized and richer, they will in all probability follow Europe, Japan, and North America in having low birth rates and close to zero population growth. How does that work? When countries are poor, people have more children because most children die before they reach reproductive age. In England in 1600, half the children died before the age of six. As industrialization and free market economics make countries richer, people begin having fewer children, and most children do live to become adults. For example, in the United States in 1776, the average family was seven children. In 1876, the average family had 4.6 children, and in 2000, the average family had 2.1 children. This same decline in average family numbers seems to be happening all over the world. And so long as free market economics and democratic political systems continue to grow, creative human beings will continue to solve resource challenges to create more wealth, achieve better health, lower their birth rates, and believe it or not, 
find more open spaces, more wild areas. Wait, wait, that's going too far, you say. How could that be? More people, more wild areas? Well, look at New England today and compare it to New England 150 years ago. In the 19th century, settlers cleared the trees from most of the hills and mountain valleys and then farmed the marginal soils of much of New England. Where they couldn't raise decent crops, they grazed sheep on the denuded hillsides. Populations were lower, yes, but poverty was higher and pollution was more, not less. Today, farms in New England are many fewer, but much more productive. Forests are much more common. Much of the land is open to wildlife and recreational activities for harried urban dwellers from eastern metropolises where factories and service industries have created the wealthiest coastal region in the world. In New York, Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C., populations are among the densest in the world, but access to wilderness recreation is among the best in the world, and pollution is arguably at the lowest level in 150 years. You don't agree? Well, let's look at the record. Climate change. 30 years ago, it is true, most experts claimed resource depletion and population growth were two extremely serious world problems, perhaps the most serious problems the world faced. Today, however, the majority of experts, not necessarily the ones who get the most publicity, agree with the views stated in this program. Resources and wealth are not like a large pie, Resources are unlikely to ever run out. Population growth is no longer considered the crisis it once was. And finally, the majority of experts on toxic waste issues, again, not necessarily the ones who get the most publicity, also agree with the view in this program that toxic pollution is at most a minor problem today in the U.S., Canada, and Western Europe. There are, of course, still many places on Earth with serious pollution problems. But environmentalists can take credit for having spearheaded movements in the 20th century, North America and Western Europe, that have made the air, water, and Earth cleaner and more healthful than they have probably ever been in human history. The majority of experts today, however, do claim that there is one important exception to this claim. Carbon dioxide in the air is on the increase, and possible climate change is indeed a serious worldwide problem. Here too, as with resource and population issues of the past, the doomsayers, like former Vice President Al Gore, have received the most publicity and seem to be the most active and believable today. If you read the newspapers and listen to television news shows, you might be pardoned for thinking it is the view of all reputable scientists. Strangely though, despite the media hype, recent polls in the US and Canada show that most people put possible climate change very low in their estimate of problems we face in the 21st century. When asked to rate the 20 most serious national problems, for instance, climate change or global warming almost always comes out last. And when push comes to shove, most legislators put jobs and economic growth far above possible climate change. When it comes to possible climate change, and what to do about it, the views in this program are admittedly in the minority today. However, you might be surprised to know that this minority includes a substantial number of world-class climatologists, economists, and Nobel Prize winners. These contrarians say that ordinary people may have a point. These experts point out that one, even though the climate may change, and probably will, it is not the huge problem the majority claims it to be. And two, when and if climate change does accelerate in the 21st century, humans will not only cope with it, they will probably end up richer, not poorer. 
Just as the decline of whale oil led to the discovery of petroleum, just as the explosion of industry and population in the 19th century led to the wealth of the 20th century, so the possible warming of the earth may lead to extraordinary progress in efficiency, new energy resources, new ways of controlling nature, new progress in agriculture worldwide, and dramatic progress in health care. Let's be specific. All informed scientists agree that carbon dioxide has been increasing in the atmosphere in recent decades. And all agree that the increase has come from humans burning fossil fuels in much larger quantities since the Industrial Revolution began a century and a half ago. They also agree that there is an atmospheric phenomenon called the greenhouse effect. Some gases in the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor, the most important greenhouse gas, reflect infrared heat rays back to Earth and make our planet a warmer place than it would be without these reflectors. Fortunately, if it weren't for these greenhouse gases, Earth would be too cold for life of any kind. Clouds are even more important causes of temperature variations on Earth, but their influence is mixed and not very well understood. On the one hand, clouds cool the Earth by reflecting solar rays back to space instead of letting them warm the Earth. On the other hand, clouds warm the Earth by reflecting infrared rays back to Earth as the greenhouse gases do. As you can see, it's complicated, and even expert climatologists disagree about many of the details. They do agree, however, that global warming today is real. The world has warmed in the 20th century, though only about one degree centigrade. That said, many climate scientists point out that man-made carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere do not necessarily mean the climate will get still warmer in the 21st century. They point out that, one, carbon dioxide is a very minor gas in the atmosphere, around three one-hundredths of one percent, and of much less importance to the greenhouse effect than water vapor or cloud cover, for instance. And two, climate change has occurred throughout Earth's history. Many times over the last few thousand years, the earth has warmed and cooled. In medieval times, Greenland was green with a thriving agriculture and cattle culture. A few hundred years later, there was a little ice age and people were ice skating on the Thames River in London. These warm and cold periods in the Northern Hemisphere may or may not have been true for the earth as a whole. The evidence is inconclusive. Some climatologists point out, however, that in past climate changes over many thousands of years, the carbon dioxide percentage in the atmosphere has increased after the temperature increased, not before. In other words, it has presumably been an effect, not a cause of climate change. Three, climate is affected by a very large number of variables making long-term predictions unreliable, even with the aid of modern computers. And four, detailed predictions about possible rain pattern shifts, sea level changes, disease vectors, destructive storms, and so forth, due to changing climates, are even more unreliable. All that said, this contrarian minority of climate scientists and economists admit that, yes, some of the scary scenarios might happen in the coming decades. Sea levels may rise. Rains may change their patterns. Diseases may come to regions immune in the past. Polar bears may be threatened by habitat loss. They also point out, however, that some regions may benefit from a warmer climate. Farms in Canada, Russia, Scandinavia, in the northern U.S. will have longer growing seasons. More carbon dioxide in the air will act as a stimulant to plant growth worldwide. And since far more people in the world today die from cold than die from heat, there may be a net gain of people if the climate worldwide gets warmer. 
Well, benefits or dangers, what should we do about it now? How much of present wealth should we spend to prevent possible future changes in the world climate? And here, many contrarian climate scientists, and especially many mainstream economists, say, go slow. In the 21st century, they point out, there are now and there will be in the future many challenges, not just one. The Earth's two largest countries, for instance, China and India, are both rapidly industrializing, and the people there are getting richer, better fed, and healthier, and birth rates are lowering day by day. Just a few decades ago, both countries were being written off as desperately poor, gravely overpopulated, and incurably polluted. And today there has been immense progress on all of these fronts. Here in one of the poorest provinces of China, for instance, you can see superhighways, new hospitals, lush farmers' markets bulging with produce, new apartments, internet cafes, lively schools with ambitious young teachers, productive rice fields, tourist attractions, and first-class hotels. Yes, there is still poverty and pollution, but the progress over the past few decades has been truly remarkable. And this progress has been due to the same two forces that brought such progress to Western countries in Europe, North America, and Japan. Industrialization using fossil fuels, mainly coal, and free market economics. If China or India were to drastically cut back on their energy supply by severely restricting the burning of fossil fuels, they realized they would condemn themselves to a heartbreaking relapse into poverty, violent political problems, soaring unemployment, and rampant pollution. Needless to say, they are unlikely to do this voluntarily. Contrarians point out that the world has other challenges as well, far more immediate and severe than climate change. For instance, disease epidemics like malaria, AIDS, tuberculosis, and chronic diarrhea destroy millions of human beings every year, as do desperate shortages of safe drinking water and basic sanitation, poverty and malnutrition in many parts of the developing world. If we are to spend vast sums to help the world's environment, which after all includes its people, we would be wise to concentrate on what we know is here today rather than spending our wealth to protect against speculative dangers 50 or 100 years from now. Still, yes, with all these caveats, contrarians admit that climate change is real. So can we do something now to protect ourselves from the negatives of possible climate change in the future while maintaining and indeed increasing our industrial growth and worldwide progress? Well, it's true that many scientists, economists, and politicians agree with former Vice President Al Gore that we do need to take dramatic and drastic steps now to cut back fossil fuel use as soon as possible, even if it does slow down economic growth and wealth creation. Well, contrarians disagree. Using the same computer projections of climate change that the doomsayers use, they point out that Reducing possible future climate warming by even a single degree centigrade would require many trillions of dollars today and would severely stunt, if not reverse, economic growth in both the industrialized and the developing worlds. Contrarians do agree that we should by all means increase our research into new energy systems and new ways of using energy and all other natural resources more efficiently. The best way to do this, however, may not be lavish public subsidies that only too often fail to pick winners and waste resources, but instead to put our faith in the old-fashioned profit motive that solved so many problems like this in the past. No one knows now, for instance, which new energy system or which new pollution controls will be the most effective. Given time, the free market will sort them out. 
Some, probably most, will fail, but some will succeed, and that success will benefit us all. We may find, for instance, that genetically engineering new kinds of plants that would be more efficient in removing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere will be successful. We may find that new ways of capturing carbon dioxide from power plant smokestacks and sequestering it underground or under the ocean will work well. Or we may want to build new nuclear power plants as an alternative way to create electricity as well as hydrogen for use as a vehicle fuel, a way that will not create any carbon dioxide. Or, who knows, no one could have predicted computer power 100 or even 50 years ago. We may find new technologies to replace fossil fuels that no one can even dream of today. Short of direct subsidies, rich countries of Europe, Japan, and North America can encourage development of new carbon-free and carbon-sequestering technologies, perhaps, by putting modest taxes on fossil fuel use in the form of carbon taxes or indirectly by cap-and-trade schemes. Modest, but not crippling. It's a matter of degree. Contrarians use an analogy here. Just as we could dramatically reduce traffic fatalities by passing laws to reduce maximum speeds to five miles an hour, so we could reduce the chances of global warming by severely restricting fossil fuel use. But would that be wise? In other words, there is always cost versus benefits, no matter how you slice it. Yes, we may find climate change brings serious problems, just as traveling 70 miles an hour leads to serious accidents. Do we want to give up the benefits of vehicle travel to save lives lost in accidents? Do we want to cripple economic growth for the as yet only possible benefits of reducing climate change? Well, in the end, as with resources and population, the most promising moral seems to be technology is a friend, not an enemy. Wealth is good, not bad. Free market economic systems are not perfect, but they have brought a new world of material progress and vigorous health to the Western world in the last two centuries. It would be foolish to abandon them now, just as they are doing the same for the developing worlds of Asia, Africa, and South America. Instead of the doomsayer's equation that makes population, wealth, and technology bad things, we should be rallying instead to a more promising equation. E equals WTCE. E, environmental progress, that is, comes from W, wealth, multiplied by T, technology, and multiplied by C, creativity, and all cultivated in E, an environment of freedom. For those who work hard and search creatively, resources and wealth are unlimited. We need not fear more people to share the Earth's bounty, and even climate change is to be welcomed, not feared. In truth and in fact, insofar as freedom and science prevail in the 21st century, we, that is all the people on this small planet, can and will be winners. <laughs>